Okay, so we're going to uh, end the day by talking about CT acceptance testing, QC, and artifacts. And some of this material I uh, got from Jim, so he's sort of a co-author here. And those are my disclosures. This is uh, a team of folks at my institution that also helped with this. So our learning objectives here are, and you can see, <laughs> I will have to apologize. I was supposed to, I mean, I designed this program. I was supposed to focus on acceptance testing, and I got confused and really focused on annual testing. And so you're going to see this weird mix of acceptance testing and annual testing as we go through here. You can see at this point, I was focused on annual testing instead of acceptance testing. So we're going to focus actually a little bit on both. Uh, we're going to talk about daily QC quality control and what that means or maybe what it should mean and um, the basic components of such a program. And I'll show you some, some results that you might see. So acceptance testing, what do we want to watch out for? And what kind of new stuff do we have to deal with with these more and more complicated scanners? Why bother with daily QC? And what should we expect if we start this up? Um, artifacts, what kinds of artifacts might we see? And how do we look for them? And what do we do about them? OK, so this is the embarrassing part. It says acceptance testing. It was supposed to be about acceptance testing, but I had just gotten done with an annual test, and we are working on the ACR QC manual. That's all about annual testing. And so in my head, I managed to get these completely swapped around. So these are the basic tests that are going to be in the ACR CT QC manual. It should be out this year, we're hoping. I think it's at the publishers now. So it's very, very close to coming out. This is uh, the section that Doug Pfeiffer wrote. So if you don't like it, go complain to him. <laughs> but this is kind of the list of annual tests that um, are included in this QC manual. For acceptance testing, we do all this stuff. And there isn't really a lot of uh, documentation and guidelines on what we are expected to do for acceptance testing in CT. So I'm going to tell you what we do at my institution in addition to this list. We actually measure the helical slice sensitivity profiles for every helical image thickness offered. Uh, it's a lot of work, but we only do it that one time just to make sure that the images are the way they're supposed to be. We check CT numbers for darn near everything with that water phantom. We look at all of the helical image thickness options, all the axial image thickness options, uh, pretty much all with just the standard algorithm. So there's a lot of water measurements. We check uh, low contrast resolution a couple different ways. Uh, we're mostly GE, and they actually they're newer scanners have an onboard tool for a statistical approach to uh, determining low contrast resolution. And we step all the way through that. We do that uh, the way that it's specified in their documentation. And we also usually throw a, a cat fan, fan on there and do some low contrast checks that way. Um, they have advantages and disadvantages both ways. So we're just kind of doing it both ways right now. We check the spatial resolution um, in a little more careful way than we do that's available on the, the daily water phantom. So again, we're using the cat fan for that. It just has uh, more, uh, it goes up to a, a higher resolution step. And then the, about the only thing we do differently on dose than the annual test is uh, then the newer scanners that have dual energy capabilities, we're actually checking the dose on every single option. And the way these dual energy scanners work with GE is there are some preset protocols, maybe 45 or so, different protocols, and about a dozen are for the head, so we use the head phantom, and the rest are for the body, so we use the body phantom. And the dose measurement works exactly the same. There's um, nothing tricky to it. 
We use the pencil chamber, we look at CTD eyeball, compare it to what's on the display, and they've been so far very close. So that's what we do for acceptance testing in addition to these annual checks. Another piece that's new, maybe new to you, uh, that's also in the ACR CTQC manual is a recommendation to do something called protocol review. This is becoming more, I don't know, politically correct uh, around the country. So this is something that we decided was really a good thing for the physicists to be involved in. It is really a team effort. It's not something that you should expect to dump on one person and be done with it. But these are the, uh, the pieces that are written into this ACRQC manual. We want you to take a look at at least, at a minimum, these four uh, protocols and consider things like the acquisition details, uh, the reconstruction details, and the dose. What about all these new fancy scanners coming out? What do we have to do for those? Well, if you have uh, two x-ray tubes, you may want to look at the image quality for both tubes, separately if possible. Uh, very often, to get to that B tube, it sounds like you mostly have to do that in service mode, which is becoming sort of less desirable. If you want to calculate the dose for each tube, and you don't want to mess with service mode, then what you want to do is test with both tubes on, one tube alone, and then you calculate this tube. So you've got both, one, and you just figure out what the tube is for, uh, the dose is for tube B. The KV switching part happens so fast on a system that switches that it's just not, not a, uh, any kind of an issue. For the cardiac dose, which is also, I think, probably going to get even more attention moving forward, you want to use the big phantom, even though it the car, you know, the heart's kind of small. You might be tempted to use the little one. No, you want to use the big fan because it's a it's a full body exam. And you will, in order to do this right, though, you're going to need to fake the scanner out that there's actually something with a beating heart on the table. So there's usually a way to do that. Um, you just have to figure out how to set it up and plug it in and, and get it going. Pediatric dose, uh, we're starting to do this on an annual basis and also during acceptance testing. Uh, this is the small phantom on the tabletop, so that's the only real difference there. And if you have one of the, these new scanners that actually does a 420-degree revolution for head scans, then you need to think about how you're going to handle that, because that's really going to affect uh, the peripheral measurements in, in a big way. No one's quite sure, as far as I can tell, what to do with things like iterative recons. Um, the way these iterative recons work, as far as I can tell, is they try and avoid messing with edges of things, and they try and smooth areas that aren't close to an edge, which works great in a clinical environment, and what's it going to do with a phantom? No, not too sure. It doesn't seem like it's going to mess it up, but not sure, at least I'm not convinced, it's really going to work quite the same in a phantom versus in a, uh, in a patient. What do we do about these um, systems that are designed specifically to reduce organ dose? For example, the Siemens flash scanner has this thing called X-Care, which is really recycling their hand care feature. The idea is that the X-ray tube is turned off or turned way down in a certain portion of the rotation in order to reduce dose to surface organs. Should we verify this? How would you go about doing that? And so these are things we're going to have to think about and probably try and do, but in a, in a really practical, quick way and not get too bogged down in it. Okay, question number one. How should the radiation exposure measurement for a cardiac CT exam be performed? Axial sequential scan mode, 16 centimeter CTDI phantom. Axial sequential scan mode, 32 CTDI phantom. Helical scan mode, 16 CTDI. Helical scan mode, 32 CTDI. Don't even bother because we can't do this. 
Oh, I need to do something? Sorry. Okay, so we are still in pencil mode, pencil chamber mode, which means we've got to stick with that axial um, acquisition for our dose measurements. So answer B is the correct answer here. So it's axial or sequential. Some uh, vendors call it axial, others call it sequential. And the big phantom. So we definitely got the big phantom part across. Bob Dixon would object to about everything I say. Okay, Sam's question number two. How can the radiation exposure from the secondary x-ray tube and a dual source CT scanner be evaluated without resorting to using surface mode? So, number one, measure the A tube, measure both tubes, take A minus the sum to get B. So this is just a quick, are you paying attention, thinking? So let's um, look through those and figure out the one that makes sense. Okay, sorry, I jumped the gun on you, I think, a little bit there. So the right answer is B, so you measure both and you subtract off tube A alone. Okay, so now we're going to move on into quality control. So the purpose here of instituting quality control is that Things are getting more complicated, and we're thinking we need a little bit more oversight into what's happening on the scanner. The whole field is becoming more quantitative. People really are wanting to measure things, measure changes, measure response to therapy, really getting uh, just a lot more quantitative, which actually has a lot of implications, but some of them are we need to really focus on that for CT in terms of quality control. If we have improved reliability, kind of all around, we should have fewer repeat exams. That's always a good thing. And really, I think we're looking for an overall improvement in quality. So typically, daily QC would be performed by the technologist running the scanner before the first patient of the day. Should be streamlined, fast and easy. We're not looking to do a quickie annual test. That's like not the goal here. Somehow, the results need to be recorded. And again, easy and fast. Um, a lot of places use paper. That's better than nothing. It's way better if you can get it into an electronic system right from the start. Because then you can actually look at it and plot it and, um, I think, make a lot better use out of it. And so the, re the reaction that we're likely to get from this, from the clinic is are you completely nuts? Do have you no respect for the clinical operation? Nobody's going to put up with this. But this is going to be part of the uh, ACRCTQC manual coming out. And this is the section, actually the technologist section, that I wrote. So if you have a problem with this, I'm the one you can complain to. The idea here is to really confirm the scanner is operating at some minimally acceptable level before you start to scan patients for the day. <coughs> I'm going to share with you some data that we've uh, just recently analyzed. We're just about ready to uh, submit this manuscript for publication. We've gotten over, well over 100 scanner years worth of daily QC data. This is a mix of both GE and Siemens scanners in our routine area, in our interventional radiology area, and in our hybrid areas. So it's a big, big wad of data. We did daily quality control on the water phantom on every one of these scanners every day. We used the manufacturer's tolerances, for the most part, to determine if it passed or if it failed. The way this is implemented at our facility, because it's so big and so spread out, we actually have the tech run the, run the scan on the water phantom, and then when they end the exam, it's transferred automatically to an offline computer that does all the work. So all of the numerical analysis is really done automatically by a computer. And we've been doing this long enough and have enough scanners to have collected a lot of data. 
So what actually fails over time? Well, this is how we're analyzing the data. This is the water phantom, and the, the gray level is all screwed up here just to show you these regions of interest. So we're looking at the center region and two peripheral regions for the water mean and standard deviation from the center, and then we're also looking at uniformity of the water value. We'll also look at what we're calling linearity, but it's really what's the water value here, the acrylic value here, and the air value out here. And you can see that we have a, a GE QC protocol, Siemens QC protocol, and an in-house QC protocol. And these are the fail rates after 100 scanner years worth of data. The thing that fails the most often, and it's still under 1%, is the standard deviation. Oops. So that's kind of the number one thing I think we should be testing every morning because that's what fails the most. And it doesn't fail a ton, but it does fail. Since we get the water mean at the same time, we might as well record that as well. So that's my two basic tests that I would want to run every day on a CT scanner. What's the standard deviation of water uh, and our water phantom, and what's the mean? Now, this is a plot over five years of the mean water value. So this is uh, how close is it to zero? It's supposed to be zero on, what, six different scanners. These are all 16-slice GE scanners, and we plotted this just to see what it kind of looked like, and it's got kind of an interesting pattern. What we're seeing on these scanners is sort of a slow decline in water value, and then our annual PM, where it gets recalibrated and gets fixed, and then it slowly declines again over a part, period of about a year, and then it gets recalibrated again, and then we have this slow decline. So most of these scanners are exhibiting the same sort of pattern, where we start out at some value and just slowly, over the course of a year, um, it moves down and doesn't move a lot, maybe moves from plus one to minus one. It's certainly not failing, but it's just sort of an interesting trend that we would not have noticed if, if we hadn't looked at it sort of long-term and big picture. So these are the two things that I would want to test on the water phantom numerically. The other thing that's, to me, probably even more important than this is looking for artifacts. And this is just a flat field water View. This is just eyeballing, seeing what's there, looking at it with a reasonable window width and level, and that's it. So this isn't a, a whole ton of work. We are using this approach on our routine bread and butter scanners, our interventional scanners, our hybrid PET and SPECT, and not sure what we're doing actually on our simulation scanners. We may need to go down there and get in their face and make sure that they're doing this too. So what do you do? What, what scan parameters do you, do you use? I recommend that you use whatever the manufacturer's spec is re revolving around because what happens is if you use your own, you make up your own, then you make up your own fail limit, and you will eventually get a scanner that fails, and the manufacturer service engineer will come in, he will use his own, and it will pass, and he will look at you like you're from another planet. The scanner is fine. What do you mean it doesn't pass your QC? So you might as well just use what they use so that when it fails, uh, it'll be for real, and they'll just go ahead and fix it. This is a histogram of standard deviation results. So we've looked at the standard deviation over a bunch of scanners. These are all 64-slice scanners. So these are all GE scanners. Over time, so this is many years' worth of data, and this is where the standard deviation values are falling. So this is a, a histogram of the standard deviation values. You can see that the current limits, the GE sets, are over here, and the data is kind of in a different place. So we're suggesting to GE that they may want to adjust their uh, tolerance limits to something that's perhaps a little bit more appropriate. So if you're doing this and you're noticing that your 64 slice scanners seem to fail a lot on standard deviation, uh, we would agree with you. And actually the HD scanners, the 750s, are even higher and have uh, even more 
move into the right side of that uh, fail limit. And we really are leaning on GE to rethink this. Okay, Sam's question number three. If the water phantom test result passes each day, why bother to record it? A, there can be a lot of value in examination of long-term QC data. B, federal law demands it. C, all state regulations require it. D, the ACRCT accreditation program requires it. And E, AAPM insists on it. Okay, so there is a lot, there can be a lot of value in looking at long-term QC data. Right now, the ACR accreditation program does not require it that I'm aware of. They ask you what you do on a, on a big form, but there's nobody out there hounding you to actually do this every morning. But that QC manual will be coming out very soon. Um, yeah, I was thinking about that. So the question was, is it suggested or is it demanded? And I don't quite remember how that was worded. We'll have to take a, another look at that. So Sam's question number four. You are preparing to launch a new hybrid scanning service. So this is a nuclear medicine camera combined with a CT. What do you expect the reaction will be regarding your CT QC instructions? So you're instructing the technologist operator, and you're, the question is, what are they going to react? How are they going to react to your instructions? Yeah, this is a terribly worded question. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just ragging on everybody else about that. So is the tech going to say to you, who needs QC? Or why bother to record these results? Or, is that all we have to do? You're kidding, right? Or, what a waste of time. Or, we don't do QC around here. So what's your, your nuke med tech, now remember, this is nukes, going to react? How are they, what are they going to say? Okay, so this is actually a true, <laughs> true story. The supervisor at my institution said, that's all we have to do? You're kidding me. <laughs> they do so much QC and nukes compared to the rest of radiology that this was just a big joke to them. We just scan a water phantom and walk away? Come on, there's got to be more. And I was like, no, that's, and we're doing a lot more than everybody else. And they're like, oh, this is weird. This is a you know very strange place to be. So you're likely to get a gamut of um, reactions from people. But don't be surprised if the nukes folks don't just jump right on this, because this is their light. This is their world. They really do a lot of QC. Okay, artifacts. Artifact analysis should be incorporated into your QC scan program. Hunting for artifacts is very different than more or less recognizing them, maybe if you've had enough coffee that morning. You must set the appropriate window level settings, but once you do that, you can really whip through them quick in stack mode. And what I've noticed is um, we actually do weekend duty. The physics, the physicists at my institution share weekend duty to make sure that these, this is actually happening on the weekends because that's kind of a problem. And uh, so I have to do this on some Saturday and Sunday mornings. And when I look through them, your eyeballs can, can see maybe a two ounce full unit difference in a water phantom. It's amazing how sensitive your eyes are compared to what the numbers really look like. So I would recommend axial or sequential scan mode for this. And what we're doing is actually using the thinnest detector spacing available. So this is going to be thin images. But when you do that, then you're not testing the whole detector service surface. So we actually do it twice, once with super thin images, and once with the thinnest image that actually covers the detector surface. And so that's two quick passes. It really runs pretty fast. Mostly what you will see are rings of the type that Jim um, alluded to a little bit earlier. You will see things that are very subtle to very severe. 
most often our uh, reaction is to either just redo it right away. Sometimes the uh, position of the phantom is a little bit off, and that can sort of exaggerate the problems. Or we'll go ahead and do the air calibrations again, sometimes a couple of times, to, to get through all of the, the resets. So these are some examples of our daily QC uh, artifacts. And they are mostly rings. These are some streaks that I'll talk about in a minute. This was actually, I think, uh, bubbles in the tube or something kind of weird. So that was a, a non-ring artifact. But the rest of these are definitely uh, ring-like. You want to be a little careful of these automated manufacturer's checks. We do have quite a few Siemens scanners in our um, facility, and Siemens has this constancy thing that you kind of have to go through. It forces you to go through every morning. And both of these artifacts pass the daily constancy test. So they're doing something with subtracting images, and sometimes I think that process actually subtracts out the artifacts, and they may not get um, actually picked up. So we're doing this artifact analysis on all of the scanners every morning. This is something new and different. Um, I don't think I've presented this anywhere before, so you're my guinea pigs. We started to see this particular type of a problem on our Lightspeed 16 scanners in about 2008, and it just started to be more and more frequent. And what tended to happen was that it was the radiologists who were noticing it. It somehow snuck by the technologists totally. And usually the techs will pick up on stuff like this right away because that means somebody's taken down their scanner and they get a break. So they're really looking for reasons to take down scanners. But these were subtle enough and I think infrequent enough that they got by the techs and the radiologists were complaining more and more often. So what we started to do was uh, look at, and we'd been talking about this for a long time, when, when we scan our water phantom, it's like 20 centimeters. That doesn't give you the full field of view for, for quality control. And so we've been talking about maybe doing a large phantom scan for five years, maybe 10 years, for a long time. Hadn't quite gotten around to it until these things started to pop up. And what we noticed on, uh, on worst case, when we really had these uh, streak problems, they appear just outside of this 20-centimeter water phantom. That phantom fits right inside where all these problems are. So clearly, we're never going to catch it with our little phantom. We have to use the bigger phantom in order to see these. So do we need to do that every day? Well, certainly not. We're doing it actually on a weekly basis, but you could probably get away with, you know, every other week, maybe once a month. Maybe you don't need it at all. Um, but I would look into it. Try it out. Uh, you might be surprised. We, once we started to do this, it was the biggest mess ever. We decided that we wanted to make sure our scanners were running at the beginning of the week. Kind of made, you know, intuitive sense. Let's get things right at the beginning of the week so that we can be confident everything is good. I hadn't really thought about the fact that Monday is our busiest day and, you know, the schedule kind of goes down towards the end of the week. So trying this on Mondays was probably really dumb in uh, hindsight. And we didn't have any appreciation for how widespread a problem this is. We see it on our 64s and on our 16s. And so the first week we did it, and we started with a big bang, of course. We didn't just do a couple of scanners at a time. We just said, we're doing this across the board. This is a big problem. And we wound up with, like, half of the scanners being out of service. It was a disaster. Unmitigated, everybody screaming, blood and bloody murder, uh, just a mess. So if you're going to do this, I would do it slowly, um, maybe on the weekends or Fridays. Right now what we do is Friday morning, that's when we do this, first thing, and we have all of them in and looked at by noon so that if anything needs service, we start Friday afternoon 
And if it runs over the weekend, well, that's fine. We know we're good for Monday. That's kind of the idea. And we actually triage these. We look at them. We say, okay, we got three bad scanners. Which is the worst? We'll take that one down. We'll let the other ones run for a while. When that one's back up, we'll take the next severest one down. Get that fixed. So it's, uh, it took us a while to get to this, but... Um, but it's working very well now. And it actually took a solid six months before we had a break. There was one scanner at least down every week for quite a long time until we really shook this all out. So we were doing this in our routine area, and we're describing it, and uh, we have some regular uh, CT section meetings, and our hybrid folks said, gee, we're not doing this. Do you think we should? I said, yeah, I think you should, but I would go slow. <laughs> don't do it all at once, and you know, don't go crazy with it. But don't be surprised if all the scanners look bad, and you just hadn't picked up on this. And so they did it on all their scanners, and they were all fine. So it may not be as big of a deal on um, all scanners in all areas. These are some of the examples that we're seeing. And... I'm not sure you can see these all real good, but there are some streaks. Okay, where's my pointer? There are some streaks here. There's uh, Sometimes the streaks actually sort of combine to form a circle. You can sort of see more streaks there, fewer ones over here. These are more common. These fewer streaks are more common than, than the other ones. But even on a perfect phantom, you can kind of see, if you look at it close, that there's a little different texture to the outside of the phantom than there is on the inside of the phantom. So there's, you know, there's, uh, it's definitely interesting to look at. What, what are the thoughts? It has to do, yeah, I've been asking them this uh, a long time, and they keep telling me, and it's like not sinking in. So it's, it's electronics hooked to the detectors. Uh, there's two pieces, and they can't quite figure out which piece seems to be the problem, so they keep replacing both of them. It's kind of the story I'm getting. Uh, so, and they were starting to get rather uptight about this. And I'm not sure I told them that we wrote this into the QC manual, too. So that <laughs> they're really going to hear about it pretty soon. And it, that, but that was written in as more of a best practice option. That was, you know, there's absolutely no language about must or sh even maybe should, but sort of a best practice um, consideration. So what do you use for your large phantom? Uh, these are shrinking. <laughs> The, uh, the VCTs came with these 48-centimeter phantoms. Oh, and by the way, the techs hate these things. They're very heavy and clumsy and awkward, and uh, we got a lot of fussing from the techs for the first few weeks. But now it doesn't seem to be such a big deal, so they have gotten used to it. The 48-centimeter phantoms don't come anymore with the newer scanners. Now they're kind of shrunk in a little bit, so now they're 35. But um, so what we're doing, and I hadn't heard this until last week, we're actually using the 48s and sort of marching them from room to room in areas that don't have them anymore. If you don't have any of that stuff, because GE might be the only one that uh, gives you those, I would try the 32-centimeter the CTDI. That should be big enough and uniform enough to show some of these problems if they exist. And we may actually need to push the phantom suppliers sort of as a group for something that's maybe more standard. So if you try this, uh, you might see things that you haven't recognized. For a large group of scanners, this really can cause a real mess, and you might want to phase this in gradually and be ready with some kind of a triage approach. Okay, so now we're going to move into other artifacts, sort of uh, patient-related artifacts. I'm going to show you something I call the hel helicopter blade head, which is a combination of a helical pitch greater than one and swallowing at exactly the wrong point during the patient acquisition. So that's what that can look like. And GE's um, response to this seems to have been, okay, no more pitches greater than one for heads. So on their newer scanners, you may notice that option isn't available anymore. This is partly why we can't do that. These are some other uh, patient artifacts. Let's see. 
You can see some dual rings here. I should have made some notes on what, <laughs> what caused these. This one I know. This one um, seems to be a black reference detector. And this is sort of a mystery to me because every time we see this, the tech, <laughs> text response is exactly the same. But we've scanned bigger patients than this on this scanner and have never seen this before. So there's something kind of weird about, I think, the patient's shape in relation to where the reference detector happens to be. So we haven't quite nailed this down yet, but that's, uh, that's the story we're getting from GE. This particular one is an air bubble that's moving, and it makes this weird comma shape. We've seen this a number of times, too. And that one actually has been described in a paper. So if you run into that, uh, that is uh, very indicative. And it also means that the scanner is not broken, which is the text, again, the text immediate response is, oh, come and fix the scanner. But it's, it's actually not broken. That was patient, uh, patient artifact. Okay, next Sam's question. A ring artifact has emerged on a daily water phantom QC image. What is the most logical course of action? Shut the scanner down and wait for service to arrive. Ignore it and get on with things. Repeat the scan without changing anything. Maybe it'll just go away. Request a calibration service from your field engineer. Or run an air calibration scan procedure and repeat the QC scan. So what do you think? Yes. So sometimes we just run it again without the, the air calibration, but uh, usually if our physics tech is on board, they do this first. Okay, next question. Oops. The clinic has started to experience artifact in helical head exams after making some adjustments to the scan parameters. What should you ask? Was the rotation time decreased? Was the table speed increased? Was the pitch increased? Was the display field of view in decreased?